Welcome back to room 303 and to the lectures that we are giving now over Hamilton's mythology. This is lecture number three, part one, chapter two, the two great gods of earth is what she will call it, uh, Demeter and Dionysius. It, it's significant, I think, for your notes already that um, Hamilton is going to give a full chapter to just these two gods. Uh, now, I think there's some reasons for that, and we'll try and get into that at the conclusion of our time uh, talking here. Uh, just to remind, <clears throat> I recommend that you hit LearnStrong.net if you've not been watching my earlier two lectures, and watch that lecture number one, Introduction, and then finally, uh, lecture number two, the um, outline of the primary gods and goddesses. Um, again, back to my earlier suggestion, I hope that you can read this material on your own and annotate on your own and acquire your own learning, that connecting of new information to old information on your own, and then come to my lectures after you have finished reading at those three levels. What does the text say, level one? What does the text mean, level two? Again, themes, messages at 2A, rhetorical techniques at 2B. And then finally, at, at level three, how can I relate to this information in some way at 3A? How can I relate this to other texts that I'm familiar with and to my world at large? And then finally at 3B, and most importantly, how can I relate this to myself, my own understanding of the world? Um, we'll try and do some of that, obviously, in our lecture now as well as we get into this conversation. We'll begin now uh, by picking up the very first paragraph of chapter 2. I'm going to read the opening paragraph and the concluding paragraphs at the end of our time together, just simply because I want to impress on you the real brilliance of Edith Hamilton as a prose stylist. Watch how she begins. For the most part, the immortal gods were of little use to human beings, and often they were quite the reverse of useful. Zeus, a dangerous lover for mortal maidens and completely incalculable in his use of the terrible thunderbolt. Ares, the maker of war and a general pest. Hera, with no idea of justice, when she was jealous, as she perpetually was. Athena, also a war maker, and wielding the lightning's sharp lance quite irresponsibly, as Zeus did. Aphrodite, using her power chiefly to ensnare and betray. They were a beautiful, radiant company, to be sure, and their adventures made excellent stories, but when they were not positively harmful, they were capricious and undependable, and in general, mortals got on best without them. There were two, however, who were altogether different, who were indeed mankind's best friends. And it will be here, then, that we will begin our conversation with these two best friends of humankind. The first, Demeter, or Ceres, goddess of the corn, daughter of Cronus and Rhea, and the second god that she'll speak of, Dionysius or Bacchus, god of wine and revelry as it's often referred to. Finally, of course, that great uh, god of the theater as we'll speak about in a bit. Demeter is older because corn is older than wine. To quote back to the opening lines of chapter two, um, Edith Hamilton, she says, people could best understand Demeter Two, who was worshipped not like other gods by the bloody sacrifices men liked, but in very humble acts that made the farm fruitful. Through her, the field of grain was hollowed, Demeter's holy grain. Um, in other words, what the point that she wants to make, and this is true for both of these earth gods, is that neither of them were all often worshipped just in uh, or, or, or having to do with religious festivals or temples even. Um, they could be worshipped, they could be appreciated outside, if you will, of the temple. Demeter's chief festival came around harvest time. The early worship of hers, and, and this worship evolved apparently, was to just bake a loaf of bread, for example, and celebrate it through a festival. However, later, there were these mystery cults, this mysterious worship, and we know very little about this worship. Every five years, for about nine days, there was this, um, this worship that went on. 
Um, there was some stuff that happened outside of a temple and then stuff that happened inside of the temple at Elius and uh, the, near Athens and the Elysian mysteries as they were referred to. These for us are predominantly unknown. We know very little about them. Cicero, however, writing in the century before Christ will say, nothing is higher than these mysteries. They have sweetened our characters and softened our customs. They've made us pass from the condition of savages to true humanity. They have not only shown us the way to live joyfully, but they've taught us how to die with a better hope, end quote. Again, Cicero. Um, Dionysius, um, um, on the other hand, um, we're not really sure when the vine kind of took the place of um, the Elysian uh, mysteries. Um, but ended up, no one knows for sure why, ended up kind of side by side with Demeter. Um, it was natural, Edith Hamilton will argue, that both of these would be worshipped together. The breaking of bread, the drinking of wine, you can obviously see how they go together. Also, we're going to point out that each knew pain as well as joy. Both of these, let's put this in our notes because it's significant, are suffering gods. Um, other gods were untouched, we might say, by lasting grief. The way Hamilton says it in this way, what happens to the corn plants and the luxurious branching vines when the grain is harvest, the grapes gathered, and the black frost sets in, killing the fresh green life of the fields? That is what men asked themselves when the first stories were told to explain what was so mysterious, the changes always passing before their eyes of day and night and the seasons and the stars in their courses. Though Demeter and Dionysius were the happy gods of the harvest, during the winter it was clear they were all together different. They sorrowed, and the earth was sad. The men of long ago wondered why this should be, and they told stories to explain the reason. She then, will, Edith Hamilton, will then get into the famous Demeter Persephone story. It is one of the earliest of the Homeric hymns, and it is attempting to explain, among other things, the seasons, and especially winter. Let's review the story quickly. It is a story that you do need to know because it's so often referenced, especially in some of the literature that will celebrate the spring for reasons that will become self-evident once you know the story. Persephone is the young, beautiful daughter of Demeter. She is enticed by the wondrous bloom of the Narcissus um, uh, flower, and she strays too far, and in so doing, she gives Hades, the god of the underworld, the opportunity to steal. The word is sometimes actually used, rape her, but here the word rape means to take by force against one's will. Down to Hades she goes, and for nine days Demeter mother seeks for her daughter. The son tells her the story of what has happened, and Demeter will leave Olympus and will go to Elysis outside of Athens. There she will but kind of look as an old woman would, sitting there in mourning for the loss of her daughter. Four sisters will show up. They will take her to their mother, Materina, and their Materina will offer Demeter wine. And no, Demeter will say, I don't want wine, I want barley water with a little mint in it. That is to say, the drink of a poor reaper. Um, and this will become, of course, the sacred cup for worship uh, at Elysis. Uh, Demeter then will, um, will uh, be honored by the fact that she's treated so well in this house, and she will take the son, uh, Demophon, of uh, uh, Matrinus and Cilicius, and she will decide to raise this child as a young god. But in the process of doing so, uh, we'll put the young boy in a fire. And when Mama sees that, she screams, the goddess is angered, and Demeter will say that she needs to have a temple built for her. And this will uh, be the, the, the origination of why the temple then is built in honor of Demeter. Demeter, of course, is upset, right? Her daughter is not with her. She's unhappy. And so because she's unhappy, there is famine on the earth. Nothing will grow. Zeus has had enough of it. He sends Hermes down to Hades to say, Persephone must return. However, Hades is smart and he knows that if any human eats anything while in the underworld, that human then has to spend time in the underworld. And Hades will give Persephone a pomegranate seed. That's all that it takes. And 
when Demeter is told upon being, being reunited with Persephone that she, her daughter ate down in the underworld, then there has to be an arrangement. The arrangement, of course, is that for a certain period of the, of the year, we're aware now where seasons come from, right? For a certain period of the year, Demeter has to live without Persephone. That will, of course, be winter. Why? Well, Mama wants to be with her daughter, and she's sad and all of that. The language that, um, that uh, um, Hamilton will share with us, I think, is worth reading, and so let's read it. She, um, she says it this way um, through, the, uh, through the language of the prose and then the poetry. Then Zeus sent another message to her, a great personage, none other than his revered mother Rhea, the oldest of the gods. Swiftly she hastened down from the heights of Olympus to the barren, leafless earth, and standing at the door of the temple she spoke to Demeter, now in poetry. Come, my daughter, for Zeus, far-seeing, loud thundering, bids you, come once again to the halls of the gods where you shall have honor, where you shall have your desire, your daughter, to comfort your sorrow, as each year is accomplished and bitter winter is ended. For a third part only the kingdom of darkness shall hold her. For the rest you will keep her, you and the happy immortals. Peace now, give men life, which comes along from, their, from your giving. And the good goddess then will, um, Dem Demeter will say, fine. And so she will allow for her daughter to live part of the time, those three months of winter, in Hades. And of course, during that time, nothing will grow on earth. This will kind of explain the ideas of why we have seasons and the like. But there's more going on here, and Edith Hamilton wants to point this out. So let's take a few notes now just to finish this section of the chapter. Demeter is the sorrowing mother. Prosephone will represent the notion of recognition of lost youth. To Prosephone, of course, is the beautiful young girl, but because of her experience of traveling to the underworld, she somehow has grown up. She's aware, for example, that beauty, it cannot last. It is fleeting, if you will. And, and, and of course, then notice the major themes of resurrection and rebirth and rejuvenation. Of course, we think of Shelley's Ode to the West Wind, don't we? And those final lines, if winter comes, can spring be far behind? The notion of expecting during bad times that something good is coming, that Persephone will come from the underworld. And when Persephone arrives, it will be the spring. And of course, in the spring, it is an amazing time of the year. The second group of stories that will be told will be about Dionysius or Bacchus. Um, and we'll turn now to those stories. And again, the genius of what Hamilton will do is she'll just provide a series of these stories, several of them in order, and we'll want to make sure that we have some working familiarity with these stories about the other important god of the earth. If the first one is Demeter, goddess of the corn, goddess of harvest, our second will be Dionysius, Bacchus, god of wine, god of the vine, god of wine and revelry, as sometimes it's referred to. Well, what do we know about Dionysius? Well, he's born in the city of Thebes. His brother is Semain. His father is Zeus. So his mother is more is mortal, is human, right? He's the only god whose parents are not both divine. That's I mean that's significant um, to say already. Zeus, because he's so in love with Semain, says, I will give you anything that you want. Yeah, I swear it by the river Styx, he says. Um, and she says, because, the myth tells us, Hera, the wife of Zeus, goddess, has put this in the mind of Semain. Semain says, the one thing I want more than anything is to see you in all of your beauty. And because, of course, Zeus has already kind of said, I promise you, by the river Styx, he has to do it. And, of course, when, when Semaine sees Zeus, she immediately catches fire and, and, and she dies. However, she is carrying Zeus's child. Zeus, is, Zeus will reach into her body, will grab the child, will hide it in his side. Note the difference between Athena, who comes from his head, and uh, um, uh, Dionysius, who will come from the side of Zeus. And then he, uh, he, Zeus will give Dionysius to be uh, to the nymphs of Nisa, the Hades, as he's sometimes referred to, to raise the child. When he becomes an adult, then this god Dionysius becomes a wanderer, going all over the world, sharing 
the beauty of the vine, that is to say, the power of wine, right? And then we have a series of stories about what Dionysus is like as a god. The first story is the famous story about the pirates who will kidnap him because they see that he's this amazingly beautiful person and he clearly must come from a wealthy family. Let's kidnap him and we can get ransom. However, once on board the ship, it becomes clear this is no normal person. For example, when they try and tie him up, the ropes just fall off of his hands. And very quickly, they begin to realize something is up. It's the steerman who will say, we need to quickly get this guy back. This is no guy. This is a god. The other pirates are convinced that, no, 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 we can, we can for sure translate this into some money for ourselves. And it will be Dionysius who will then change into a lion. They will jump overboard, and they themselves become dolphins. Uh, however, Dionysius does not kill the, the, the steersman because, of course, the steersman showed respect. The point here maybe that we should point out is that you must always show respect to the gods or you will get jacked. And no stories uh, make this more clear than the stories about Dionysius. Our next series of stories, um, uh, next story, is about uh, Lucergus, uh, the, the Thracian king, who um, disrespects Dionysius and then is blinded by Zeus and ultimately dies. In other words, do not disrespect the gods. The, the, the reason for the disrespect is almost always the same. The uh, worship of Dionysius is always somehow attached with the wine and with um, revelry is often the word that's used. That is to say partying and that kind of thing. And because that can lead to certain kinds of chaotic behavior, right, um, then usually rulers are going to try to kind of put you know, a squash on that kind of thing. The next series of stories, uh, next story that is told is about um, uh, Ariadne, um, abandoned by Thebes, um, by Theseus, and ultimately Dionysius will love her, and when she dies, because he's, he loves her so much, he puts her crown in the stars. It's a nice story. Um, and, and then our next story is Dionysius going to Hades to save his mother, Savane, um, and takes her to Olympus and says she will now live with the gods, the gods agree, and Semaine, the mother of Dionysius, who is actually mortal, gets to live uh, on Mount Olympus. Very few um, have that opportunity. Now, the worship of Dionysius is done by the Menads or the Bacchants, and um, of, of course we have in, in Euripides telling of this story, a very famous story about this notion of the worship of Dionysius. Now, this worship has two parts for your notes. We're going to come back to this in a few moments as we finish our lecture, but let's put it in our notes right away. First of all, the worship of Dionysius, the worship of Bacchus, has to do, of course, with the freedom, the ecstatic joy that is associated with drinking wine. Because obviously, when you drink wine, you can get happy, right? But then there's also the other side of the worship. There's a savage brutality, as we're going to see in the story, that will get related now, that it's kind of scary. In other words, there's two sides to this notion of drinking wine. One, it makes you feel good. Two, if you do it too much, you get hung over, you get up in the morning, and of course you've got a bad, bad headache, or even worse, we think about drinking and driving as a classic example, don't we, right? Terrible things can happen as a byproduct because of the drinking of wine. Well, Dionysius in our story will arrive at his city of birth, Thebes, with all his entourage of women, okay? Uh, many have pointed out that the notion of groupies that will hang out with a famous rock star or whatever is actually born in this notion of the celebration of Dionysius and his worship. Pentheus is not only the king of Thebes, but he's actually Dionysius' cousin. He's the son of, of Semaine's sister, but he doesn't know it. And he is, he is in Euripides' play. He is immediately not pleased at all with what's going on with, uh, with Dionysius as he shows up. And ultimately, he is going to try to punish Dionysius. Dionysius will say to him, you are making a monumental mistake by disrespecting me. Ultimately, out onto the mountain goes Pentheus in search of Dionysius. He himself um, is, is out there in the wilderness, 
the women who, the Bacchants, the women who are in, uh, uh, worshiping Dionysius, go into an ecstatic frenzy. They see him, they attack him, and they tear him apart limb from limb and eat his flesh. The first one to do it is actually Pentheus's own mother. It's a disgusting um, story, and yet it speaks directly to this notion of what is most dangerous about the Dionysian uh, festival, the brutality of it and the like. Well, out of this raises some interesting questions. Why is it that the Elysian Mysteries and the worship of Demeter is somehow supplanted by Dionysius in the Dionysian festival? Hamilton gives an interesting observation. She says, it's because of the type of festival, the type of worship. While the Elysian Mysteries were quiet and they were secretive and ultimately died out, the worship to Dionysius happened in the spring in a famous festival, five-day festival, where what happened? Well, yeah, lots of crazy went down, but there was also an important connection with the plays. There was a dramatic performance that would happen. For example, when you go to Athens and you stand there at the Parthenon, right next to the Parthenon on the Acropolis there, you can see a theater that's actually been cut out of the side of the mountain. You can see this in several other places as well, these theaters that are associated then with this, this festival in the spring, this celebration to uh, Dionysius. And for this reason, it's a very public kind of uh, festival. And, of course, this celebration ultimately then will lead to maybe the elongation and the saving of the Dionysian festival and the Dionysian worship. The way that uh, um, Hamilton will finish this chapter is worthy, however, of our reading. So I want to spend a few moments and just take a look at the final paragraphs of this chapter. It's beautiful writing. She will say, it was a theater, and the ceremony was the performance of a play. The greatest poetry in Greece, and among the greatest in the world, was written for Dionysius. The poets who wrote the plays, the actors and singers who took part in